Hi everyone, and welcome back to Travel Notes, a show where we use music as a medium to explore ways in which we're all connected. If you're listening in your car on the FM dial, thanks for tuning in to WOHM Radio 96.3 FM, Charleston, South Carolina's first and only nonprofit commercial free radio station. And for everyone else who's tuning in via your favorite streaming platform, thanks so much for being here. You can learn more about what we do at Travel Notes through my website, gracemcnallymusic.com under the travel notes tab and on social media at travel notes underscore podcast so here on travel notes we're big fans of pioneering artists who break new ground and today's guest fits that bill perfectly today we're talking with gambian cora virtuoso sona jabarte she's currently on tour and will be in northampton massachusetts on april 9th and kennett square pennsylvania on april 11th which happens to be a sold out show however you can find out more about her complete list of upcoming performances on her website sonajabarte.com Sona is the first professional female Cora Virtuoso to come from the West African Griot dynasties. Her lineage carries a formidable reputation for renowned Cora masters. Most notable is her grandfather, Amadou Bansang Jobate, and her cousin, the legendary Tumani Jibate. Sona is respected for her skill as an instrumentalist, her distinctive voice, infectious melodies, and her grace on stage, and she's rapidly achieving international success as a top-class performer. In addition, Sona's dedication to spreading powerful humanitarian messages through her songs and her stage performances make her much more than just a regular musician. She's a compelling social activist, speaker, and changemaker who believes in leading by example. Her achievements as a global changemaker, which we'll talk more about in our conversation today, include founding the Gambian Academy and speaking to humanitarian issues at high-profile events around the world, including summits for the UN and the World Trade Organization. I'm so excited to welcome Sona to Travel Notes. To start, I have to ask, as the world's first virtuoso female, female chora player, what were some obstacles that you faced early on in your career or perhaps still do? For myself, growing up uh, within this tradition, um, of course, it's been a challenge in terms of uh, being female within this tradition and in terms of that being accepted uh, culturally, that has, of course, not been a, an easy an easy journey. Um, but mostly um, one of the main ways that I have navigated that was to position myself um, on the stage rather than within the traditional cultural ceremonies that this music usually takes place in. Um, so uh, making myself an artist that really only appears on stage um, in some sense has given me a, a space of neutrality uh, to pave the way for acceptance because of the fact that that is a new space that's being carved out still now. Um, so that's kind of my, I have my own ways of, of navigating those challenges and not um, bringing uh, about too much resistance to what I'm doing by thinking carefully about where I position myself. Incredible. That's really fascinating. Where does this music traditionally, the core music, show up in, in traditional society? It's totally intrinsically wrapped up in most of the sort of um, uh, core uh, life cycle ceremonies, so marriages, um, uh, naming ceremonies, um, uh, and, and any, any, any events that have social significance, um, are still, uh, it's still essential to have music. And obviously nowadays in more, or more modern times, you know, uh, political campaigns and rallies and so on, uh, this is all harnessed, um, because of the fact that, that this music and this tradition still has a lot of power, uh, within society and for people. Mm, that actually brings me, um, to a question I was going to ask. What role do you think the Kora tradition has still in modern society, which you, you touched on a little bit, and then regionally, <laughs> you know, and then maybe on the global stage? Uh, regionally, it's um, it has uh, it still has a huge role in the sense of its um, um, its legacy um, of having a, a very innate connection to. Um, as I mentioned before, traditional events. However, what I'm trying to also rejuvenate and bring a lot more awareness to is the important role that it also has for young people and for people who have new things that they have 
to talk about because society, of course, always changes and the issues of society continue to change. And I feel that it's very important that our traditions are able to also adapt to incorporate those um, those challenges and to be as a used as a vessel for be able to communicate that uh, rather than making people feel that they have to abandon their traditions in order to be relevant in the current day. And I think that's a pattern that we're seeing that is quite prevalent among the younger generation. And so what I'm doing is really trying to raise that sense of accountability for people to be inclusive and to be able to actually use music in constructive and critical ways within society, which actually has always been done, um, you know, historically. Um, but I think there has been an over stagnation of some of these traditions and partially has been because of the uh, contact that these traditions have had with the rest of the world, because once a tradition becomes um, celebrated globally for being a particular way, there is that encouragement and that sort of sense that everyone needs to keep producing the same stuff in order to be uh, valued and recognized internationally, which is where a lot of the economic income comes from now. And so I think there's that's really one of, and one of the areas which, again, is quite critical that we are aware of. Uh, and can actually start to make movement to actually push back on that consciously. Absolutely. What Do you have any advice for other musicians who perhaps are starting out and facing similar obstacles that you, you did? Um, I find those questions so hard because they are incredibly general. And, uh, you know, having worked with so many young people, every single situation is so different. Um, and I haven't found a miracle cure. <laughs> um, I think it would be mm -hmm. easy if we could, right? A lot of people just wouldn't go through the struggles if there was such a simple answer to it. And so I try to be very realistic in those situations that uh, every uh, situation has its own challenges. And for us to really be able to advise people constructively, we must understand what those challenges are and what the unique paths that people can take because they're not always the same. You know, my path would not and does not necessarily fit another person right and these I'm, I'm talking about people even within the same tradition as myself they have very different challenges I've got young students uh female students for example who want to pursue tra the traditional instruments that belong to this particular tradition uh, but maybe they, they don't come from a, a real family and that navigation and that journey is very different to mine mm. So is, I think it's one that yeah. we do acknowledge the complexity of it. Not that I'm being discouraging, but I'm just trying to also sure. be realistic that um, that there is, uh, there is, I think, a different strategy for every case, really. So that's something that's interesting. Um, and if you don't mind me asking how, just because I know nothing about um, how how it works in in Western West African society, but if the mm. griots, if someone doesn't come from a griot family, so mm -hmm. are you saying that it would make it more difficult for them to then do? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I would even go so far as to say that I have witnessed that even for men coming up uh, in the Gambia, when I raised in the Gambia, but I'm not from a Griot family who wanted to take in either playing instrument or in, in, in the case that I've been exposed to uh, constructing instruments or having anything to do with the Griot tradition, there's actually far, I would say, more challenges, more obstacles that they face than a female being born into a Griot family. Again, that is generalization because obviously there will be females born in particular families that do make that very impossible but i would say a very generalized level i'm seeing uh, uh huge challenges for men uh coming from outside of real families to be able to partake in that i would say that the one thing that i have used as kind of a a passport at times has been the very fact that i still come from this family line so at the end of the day despite being female i'm still contributing to this tradition that people still hold very very strongly Amazing. Yeah, no, um, that's fascinating. That is fascinating. Um, and so let's talk about actually your work with the Gambian Academy. Um, what, what inspired you to start the Academy? And then what are some cultural um, challenges that you hope to address through your work with the Academy? So the reason that I opened the Academy was really mainly to um, try to make a contribution to um, uh, educational reform, which I feel is an essential part of the process of empowering and developing societies within Africa, uh, not just within the Gambia, but continent wide. So this is really for me about developing a blueprint, uh, something that I can demonstrate its effectiveness uh, over a particular span of time on a range of students. Uh, so this is really about curriculum development more than it is about, uh, you know, the specifics of educating a certain number of students. 
Um, and really my goal ultimately is to uh, have, uh, I think, draw more and more accountability to um, people within the education sector uh, in relation to the importance of um, education and making sure that that education is something which um, reflects their identity, reflects their culture, their traditions, their, uh, their history, so that uh, students are not having to be raised uh, in an environment where um, they are almost having to adopt a foreign culture just to be educated. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, has uh, an implicit effect on their mentality as they grow up and the paths that they choose to pursue and their success, uh, especially within a continent, because I feel that we're not giving them the basic tools that they need to succeed within their own countries. Exactly. Uh, that's really, um, if, if it feels like you're getting to the root, you know, addressing it in a way that's holistic and sustainable. So, so let's switch gears and talk about your music. Um, you're an excellent instrumentalist and you also have a beautiful voice. What are some messages that you hope to convey with your music? Well, I think most of the messages that are current for me right now are within are on the album of Badinya Kumo. Um, it's um, uh, an album which, you know, kind of in many ways bridges the gap, I think, that I have been feeling and experiencing between um, what it is that I write as a musician and what it is that I do as an activist and an educator and contribute to society. So this album really is um a, a statement in many ways about i think bringing a sense of um uh, uh um uh, action to music so music is not just about you know talking about what you think but it's also about um reflecting what you are doing uh in whatever it is that you feel that you're contributing to so that for me really is my most important um uh message behind this album uh and what i'm performing currently they're all on themes that I am directly working on, working with, and contributing to uh, in the Gambia and, and the wider community. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, and you, so you you write your own music. Um, what does your writing process look like, and what inspires you to write? Um, so, the okay. I mean, the, I'd say the process is. Um, uh, I often say that I start with a feeling. Uh, so I kind of often, often my process is just trying to figure out, uh, you know, what is the feeling that I want to convey through music and trying to find a way to express that sonically. Um, but then also, obviously, every feeling comes from something related to this world and the existence of what we we do within this world. And that sort of becomes the journey of creating a song and, and and its message and everything around it um i guess that's sort of the overarching creation process um yeah sure yeah and yeah. what projects are you currently working on oh well the gambia academy is taking up uh, a lot of my time i'm also obviously on the road pretty much full time because we yeah on average of a show every three days for every year that passes which is incredibly wow. intense yeah. um and uh but also um uh um still having a lot of educational work that I do um uh will be starting uh, my residency at uh, Berkeley in Boston oh amazing uh, I would say there's a lot of stuff going on a lot of moving parts yeah sure congrats on that though that's that's going to be um really awesome how can people support the work that you do at the the at the Gambia Academy uh, in terms of supporting the academy, um, <clears throat> whilst there's obviously the main, the the, the usual means of uh, financial support, which is very helpful because I do actually finance all of this myself, um, wow. and it's it's been a very important process for me to do that because of the fact that I'm trying to do something different, and every time you try to do something different, it's often hard to kind of go down those mainstream routes of um, of funding. And whilst I do now have a lot of support from, you know, key organizations like the UN and UNICEF and these organizations who are doing so much for, um, for development for young people in the Gambia and other countries, um, it is, um, you know, something that I still find is very important for me to keep uh, as something that I'm able to run independently because I'm actually trying to 
in many ways challenge the, the existing systems that are currently in place in in the country so um so that that carries its own challenges um but also you know a major uh, thing that we've benefited from that i i i reach out to people to contribute is through their expertise because this is an area that actually can stay with us right it's something that's quite sustainable when people are able to bring their unique expertise in the areas of academia or music or and so many different areas that we cover or social development or uh you know women's empowerment there's so many areas that we cover that um <clears throat> that i encourage people to take part in in terms of volunteering the expertise amazing amazing well <laughs> sona thank you again for taking the time and uh and and really it's so amazing and inspiring to hear about the work that you're doing and your music's beautiful. So, you know, I know it can't be easy and it's probably, you know, challenging at times, but keep doing what you're doing because it's really making a difference. Thank you very much. Yes, my pleasure. Beautiful. You you take care. All right. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye Sona. So now that you guys are familiar with Sona and her work, I'm excited to share some of her music with you. These first two tracks are off of her 2022 album, which she she mentioned earlier in our conversation. It's called Badinha Kumo, and this first one is called The Gambia, and the next one is Kambenguo, featuring Senegalese artist Yusu Nador. <laughs>
track in today's episode is called Saya, and it's off of her 2011 album, Fasia, and was also featured on the score for the documentary Motherland, which is a powerful documentary on Africa fusing history, culture, politics, and contemporary issues. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Sona Jobarte. It was truly an honor to have her on the show and learn more about her music and the incredible work she's doing through her music. If you're just joining us and want to go back and listen from the beginning, or maybe you enjoyed today's episode and want to check out more, you can do so on OWN Radio's website, ownradio963.org, where you can find us under the Current Programs tab or on my website, gracemcnallymusic.com, under Travel Notes. Huge thank you to OM Radio for having Travel Notes on the air every Monday at 5 p.m. And until next time, wishing you peace, harmony, and safe travels wherever this crazy adventure of life takes you.